Hi class, uh, welcome to this week. We're talking about the cardiovascular assessment, building on what we learned last week when we talked about um, the chest and thorax. So just like when we talked about the lung and thorax examination, when I asked you to visualize those structures that you're assessing, you'll want to do that same thing when assessing the cardiac system. This picture shows the heart in the chest wall. So you can see that it's rotated so that the right ventricle here is the largest anterior surface. It's the largest area that's, that's available when you're listening to the anterior chest wall. Uh, the heart sits just behind and to the left of the sternum, and that inferior border, or the lowest part of the right ventricle, lies just below the sternum and the xiphoid process junction. The top of the right ventricle joins the pulmonary artery at the level of the sternum, and this is the base of the heart. So the base of the heart is actually at the top of the, of the right ventricle. The left ventricle uh, is behind the right ventricle and to the left side. The lowest tip, the inferior tip, tapers and is often called the cardiac apex. So this is clinically important because it produces that apical impulse or what we call the point of maximum impulse or the PMI. And you'll learn um, more about this in the uh, exam portion of this lecture. But down here, you can see the apical impulse, which is that tapering, that inferior tip of the left ventricle. This picture illustrates the cardiac circulation through the major heart structure. So this is the part that you're going to have to go back and refresh. We will go through it briefly now, but if you don't remember this, if this is foggy at all to you, then go back and refresh you know, go back and look through some of your old books. Remember that the tricuspid and mitral valves are called the AV valves, or the atrioventricular valves. This should make sense because they're the valves between the atrium and the ventricles. So AV between the atrium and ventricles, AV valves are the atrioventricular valves. The aortic and pulmonic valves are called the semilunar valves because each of their leaflets is shaped kind of like a half moon. So let's briefly go through the cardiac circulation. You have oxygenated blood, which obviously then comes from the lung since it's oxygenated, it flows into the left atrium through the pulmonary veins, then through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, and then it's ejected out through the aortic valve into the aorta and out to the body. It then becomes unoxygenated because it gives its oxygenated blood all over the body, right? So the unoxygenated blood returns to the heart through the superior vena cava and into the right atrium through the tricuspid valve and into then the right ventricle. From there, it's ejected through the pulmonary valve to the pulmonic arteries and to the lung to become oxygenated and then the whole thing starts all over again. Obviously, remember these two things are happening simultaneously. The blood from the right ventricle and the blood from the left ventricle uh, are being ejected out um, in this kind of circular motion. The heart sounds that you hear or sometimes you feel are caused from the vibrations associated with these valves, the AV valves and the semilunar valves, closing. So when you hear lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, those are the lubs and the dubs are the valves closing. Okay, so the flow that we just talked about is broken into two major cycles. The first cycle is systole. This is the period of ventricular contraction. This is when the ventricles are contracting and ejecting that blood really forcefully uh, out, the, um, out the valves. So the ventricles are full of blood. They contract. They eject most of the blood into the aorta and pulmonary arteries, causing the pressure to reduce, and then the ventricles relax. When the ventricles relax, this is called diastole. During diastole, the blood flows relatively passively from the atrium into each ventricle. So that filling, the filling of the ventricles, is more of a passive, uh, more of a passive process. Whereas when the ventricles contract, that's very active, very forceful contractility. The ventricles fill passively. Uh, until the pressure gets high enough and then the ventricles contract again and they start the cycle all over again. So systole is uh, ventricular contraction, diastole is kind of uh, ventricular filling, you can think of it. If you think of this in terms of the valves, during systole the ventricles eject the blood out, which means 
which valves are open? The semilunar valves, the aortic and pulmonic valves are open, right? So the AV valves must have just closed, right? Because the AV valves have to close so that when the ventricles contract, they can contract and the blood can go out the right valves. You don't want the blood going back up into the atrium, right? So the AV valves have just closed and that produces the first heart sound because remember the heart sounds are caused by the vent uh, by the valves closing snapping shut so the first heart sound you hear s1 is the av valves closing at the end of systole which is also the beginning of diastole the aortic and pulmonic valves snap shut and that produces the second heart sound s2 so at the end of systole, when all the blood's been forcefully ejected out the ventricles, then the valves have to snap shut, and that causes S2, right? So the aortic and pulmonic valves shutting, closes, um, closing, produces a second heart sound. Try to make this make sense through your head, because if you have this part down, then S1, S2, and even the murmurs, as we start to learn murmurs, will make much more sense to you. Today, uh, we're going to talk about the um, these different components of the cardiac exam. So uh, the blood pressure and heart, um, and heart rates, review that if needed, because I don't think we really go over it much. Uh, JVP, carotid artery auscultation, uh, and pul um, palpation. And then the cardiac assessment, which uh, inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. First thing we'll start with is the JVP or the jugular venous pressure. This reflects the right-sided venous pressure and its apps, its, its presence usually indicates that there's fluid backup from the right side of the heart, which could be due to uh, usually cardiac issues like cardiac tamponade, could also be due to uh, heart failure, could also be due to um, hypervolemia, just you know, too much fluid. Uh, superior vena cava obstruction and other things. So here's a picture of the measurement of JVP. So you can see that the clinician is using two different straight edges to measure the JVP. Regardless of the position that the patient is in, the distance from the sternal border should be about the same. So if the head of the bed is more elevated, the JVP would be lower and the measurement would still be the same. So we tell, we tell students to make sure that the head of the bed is up high enough to make sure to make the pulsation, the jugular pulsation, to be in the upper one third of the neck. That way, you can measure it the best. It's more important to make sure you have a straight edge here, that you have a ninety degree angle there. And we'll practice this in lab as well. Uh, so, you want to measure the distance from the is that there? No, from the um, sternal angle down here and that straight edge goes straight up, and then you find the pulsation in the neck, the jugular venous pulsation, and then that straight edge goes straight out. You wanna make sure this is a 90 degree angle, and then you're measuring how many sonometers uh, uh, there is here. Normal should be less than about three centimeters. It might be um, increased in someone who has you know, fluid overload with heart failure, sometimes pregnancy, um, myocardial infarction, COPD, cardiac tampo, not all those sort of things. The hardest part for students is usually trying to figure out what is the jugular um, pulsation and what is the carotid pulsation and how do they differ. Well, the carotid is usually very easy for students to find. It's palpable. The pulsation doesn't go away when you press on it. You know, you can feel it kind of bounding there. The height of the pulsation doesn't change as the patient's position changes, as the head of the bed changes. And the height of the pulsation isn't affected by inspiration. So if the patient takes a deep breath and holds it, the pulsation will still be in the same area of the neck. The jugular pulsation, anyway, it's not usually palpable. You can see it, but then as soon as you go to palpate it, it the pulsation goes away. It's eliminated by light pressure. The height of the pulsation is somewhat position dependent. So if you if you lay the patient straight back, the pulsation should be higher in the neck. And if you bring the patient up, the head of the bed up, then uh, then the pulsation will be lower. Sometimes students will lay the the patient straight, you know, just flat on their back. If you can't see the pulsate the jugular pulsation, then then obviously there's probably not any JVP. There's no jugular venous pulse, uh, pressure. 
um, if you can't even see it when they're laying straight back. Sometimes you can only find the JVP, the pulsation, the, uh, right in the suprasternal notch. So when you're trying to find the jugular pulsation, I tell students to look for the external jugular vein, which sometimes you can just see in the neck. Um, <clears throat> that one doesn't usually have a pulsation associated with it, but then look deep to that and see the, the internal jugular vein, because that's the one you actually want to measure, is the internal jugular vein pulsation. Again, it's seen in the suprasternal notch sometimes, all the way down kind of between the clavicles, but then it should come up uh, through the neck. So change the, height, the head of the bed around until you can see that jugular, uh, internal jugular vein. The YouTube video kind of explains this and shows some of, um, and demonstrates this, and then we'll practice this in lab as well. When, um, once you are uh, assessing the carotid pulse, this should be very quick, right? So you inspect the carotid pulse, it should take a couple seconds. You're looking for the pulsation, you look for any bulges in the neck, then you move on to palpation. But remember, don't palpate both carotid arteries at the same time. You want to try to avoid the carotid sinus too, which is in that upper half of the neck. Uh, it can cause a reflexive drop in um, blood pressure and heart rate and cause the patient to kind of crump out. So make sure that you are assessing one side and then the other. The first part of palpitation includes palpating the amplitude, which corresponds somewhat to the pulse pressure. And this is the force of the heartbeat. It should be strong, but not bounding. Uh, bounding pulses could indicate some aortic insufficiency, but it also shouldn't be weak or thready, which can indicate um, hypovolemia, maybe cardiac, cardiogenic shock. Um, and there shouldn't be any beat-to-beat -beat variations in the amplitude, uh, meaning the beat sh should feel the same every single time. If you see that there's beat-to-beat -beat variations, what we call pulses alterans, which is alternating strong and weak beat. So it'd be strong beat, weak beat, strong beat, weak beat. Uh, this is almost always indicative of left ventricular systolic impairment, and it's very, um, it's not a good prognosis. Uh, if the pulse is bounding, um, which this could indicate aortic insufficiency uh, from aortic regurgitation, most often um, caused by rheumatic heart disease, not here in the United States, obviously, but, um, but uh, idiopathic aortic root dilation could also be a, a cause. Um, when you're palpating the carotid artery, you'll, you'll also feel for the contour of the pulse wave. This is a little bit more um, advanced, and a lot of times, you know, I'm happy if you can just tell me if the pulse is bounding um, and uh, talk about the um, amplitude, but the, the contour of the wave um, talks about where it occurs in relationship to S1 and S2. So the pulse should be brisk. If you find the upstroke is delayed, it could indicate some aortic stenosis. The timing of the carotid upstroke normally follows S1 and becomes before S2. So this is sometimes helpful when you're trying to differentiate between S1 and S2, which is hard to do when the heart rate is really rapid. You know, little kids who have the really heart rates, where you're like, wait, which one is S1 and what's S2? If you're feeling the carotid pulsation, you can tell which one's S1 and which one's S2 because the carotid pulse uh, follows S1 and occurs before S2. You can also auscultate the carotid pulse for the presence of carotid breweries. This doesn't, this is usually related to uh, stenosis. Um, but it's important to note that the the degree of the of the brewery, so the loudness of the brewery, doesn't necessarily indicate the severity of the aortic stenosis. Uh, but once you identify a brewery, then you need to get this um, sent on to for more evaluation. You'll use the diaphragm and then the bell of the stethoscope and make sure that when the patient is when you're assessing for breweries of of the carotid that you tell the patient to hold their breath because you want to eliminate those harsh tracheal sounds um, that you know occur when people are breathing.
You'll usually assess for the carotid pulse to auscultate their carotid pulse in someone who has cardiovascular disease or someone uh, in, you know, over the age of 40, 50 years old. This isn't generally something that we do in uh, younger adults, healthy adults. So moving on to the cardiac exam, make sure um, just by convention, usually um, we have students stay um, on the right side of the patient so that you can get a better assessment. Um, have the patient sitting, lying down, sitting, um, sorry, supine, and then leaning forward. Those are different patient positions that you're going to want to use. Try to limit it so that you're not having the patient sit up, lay back, sit up, lay down, lay down, turn around, lay on your side. Um, so try to get your rhythm to the point where you can have the patient, you know, laying down first then sitting up at the end um, or so. The best cardiac exam is going to be with the patient laying down, which is funny because Think back to all the times you've ever gone to see a clinician and do they usually listen to your heart laying down or sitting up? A lot of times they'll listen to your heart sitting up, uh, but if you ever had a cardiac problem, they would probably ask you to lay down and, and take a, a, a better listen to um, the area. So the heart and, um, examination starts with inspection just like most system examinations always start with inspection right first you're just observing and inspecting the area uh, with the cardiac exam inspection and palpation you want to palpate over these different areas here these kind of what we call ape to man areas and we'll talk about that in a little bit but over each of these areas which corresponds to um, an area where the valve opens or closes or the the direction that the blood is flowing when the valve opens and closes. So feel these different areas, inspect these different areas using the finger pads obliquely over the chest wall and look for any ventricular impulses that cause your fingers to lift or to heave. You can also feel for any purring sounds uh, which are thrills, kind of like a cat's throat. You know if the cat is, if you're petting a cat and it's purring, um, that feeling of the cat purr is, is similar to a, a thrill. These might be common in someone with aortic stenosis, uh, ventral septal defect, um, patent ductus arteriosus. Here's a picture of a um, patient of mine. Um, I think it's a video. Hold on. Oh, yeah. So take a look at my fingers here when um, I'm feeling her chest wall. Can you see my fingers moving there? Great. Did you see my fingers move there? That was um, a heave and a lift um, on that chest, on her chest wall. She had um, significant aortic stenosis. The apical pulse, or the point of maximum impulse, is the pulsation of the left ventricle. This is really the only normal uh, pulsation that you should palpate in the chest wall. It's usually at the apex of the heart. It's you can feel it in majority of individuals, more, greater than fifty percent. It might be a little bit displaced in someone who's pregnant because they have kind of that fluid overload. And then uh, CHF, congestive heart failure, and cardiomyopathy, obviously. Cardiomyopathy is, you know, an enlarge, enlargement of the heart. So it might may be displaced in that, um, in that setting as well. You might not feel it in someone who is obese or has really thick chest wall muscles. Uh, or an increased AP diameter, such as in patients with COPD, where their chest wall expand, or their chest expands and kind of have more barrel chested. You normally should be able to fill it in the left intercostal space in the midclavicular line. That's what this ICS MCL stands for: intercostal space, midclavicular line. If you can't feel it, have the patient roll to their left lateral decubitus position, which just means you know if they're laying down, roll to their left uh, a, a little bit and. Um, you might be able to feel it better then because that having them roll will bring the bring the cardiac structures closer to the chest wall and you might be able to feel it better in women or men with big with large breast tissue have them um, you know pick their breast tissue up so that you can feel that area because in women a lot of times this the PMI is really around the same area as their um, bra um, Kind of the wire from their bra or the under um, the under support structure of their bra so have them displace that area so that you can feel for the PMI normally it should be felt in one inner space between two ribs in one of those inner spaces it should be shorter than s1 
uh, if it's sustained, meaning you can feel it through S1 and S2, that's abnormal. If you can feel it in more than one inner space, that's also abnormal, can usually indicate some ventricular enlargement for some reason, usually cardio, uh, you know, cardiomyopathy, pregnancy, CHF, etc. You could percuss the heart, that's a possibility. Um, after inspection and palpation, the next step in assessing someone is, is palpation, or I mean, excuse me, is percussion. But this maneuver is, has very little use in most clinical situations. It could be helpful in patients that you don't feel the apical impulse if you want to try to map the cardiac uh, border and see if there's some enlargement. But now, nowadays, you know, a chest x-ray um, can usually do the same thing. But also just feeling the PMI if it's displaced could tell you that there's cardiomyopathy as well. So it's not really useful um, uh, in this day, especially in females because of large breast tissue uh, and things like that. But you can practice this in lab, but it's not routinely helpful in most clinical situations. I can't tell you that I've ever percussed a heart border, even out of um, curiosity. Hmm. Okay, so the next step, the kind of the bread and butter of what we think of when you think of cardiac assessment is the auscultation but really this is the you know the fourth step so first you have to inspect and palpate you don't really need to percuss but then you have to auscultate so auscultate at the end it's important to be familiar with your stethoscope and know the differences between each of the scopes and the sides if you have one that twists or if some of them that don't twist the ed you know the diaphragm and bell don't twist um, then your you just need to have light pressure for the bell and and a harder pressure for the diaphragm so the diaphragm is more useful when there's higher pitch sounds like S1 and S2, um, in addition to some murmurs like aortic uh, regurgitation and mitral regurgitation. The bell is better for more sensitive, more low pitch sounds like the extra heart sounds like S3, S4, and some of the more um, low pitch murmurs like mitral stenosis. So um, you will auscultate with both your diaphragm and bell, or you should. These are the areas that you're going to auscultate. We call these areas ape to man, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, your first area here is at the second intercostal space, the right sternal border. This is the only area on the right side of the chest that you need to listen to. And then on the left side of the chest, the second intercostal space on the left sternal border, then you move your stethoscope down each of the intercostal spaces along the left sternal border uh, and, and then move it out to the cardiac apex, which is in that fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line. So this is kind of midclavicular. You can see the clavicle here, midclavicular in the fifth intercostal space. It's easier to remember these based on the valves that are associated with that, those sounds. And we call it ape to man. A is the aortic valve. So in this area, you'll be listening to the aortic valve. The aortic valve isn't actually there, but this is the direction the sound will travel because this is the direction of the blood flow when the aortic valve closes or opens. So A is the second intercostal space, the right sternal border, and that corresponds to the aortic valve, the area that um, you're going to hear aortic valve um, murmurs best. You might hear them all over the cardiac um, you know, the, the pericordium, but you'll hear them loudest or you'll hear them best in that second intercostal space right sternal border. The pulmonic valve you'll he'll hear best in the uh, second intercostal space on the left sternal border. Uh, herbs point, which is that third, fourth, and kind of headed down towards the fifth area of the left sternal border, is the base of the heart. And then the tricuspid valve is that fifth intercostal space on the left sternal border, and then the mitral valve is the fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line. So this is the cardiac apex down here. So at the apex, you hear, you're more likely to hear mitral valve issues. Okay, so remember this because this will help you when you're trying to identify murmurs. Once you hear a murmur, that's great, but now you have to start identifying, well, what am I hearing? What is, what possible murmur is this? So um, the sequence of the cardiac exam, you can kind of develop your own way to do this, but this is the way that we teach it. So you start with the patient supine, that's lying down. You inspect, you palpate, you auscultate all the areas with the bell, 
and the and the diaphragm. The bell is really helpful at that sternal border for tricuspid murmurs, and then out in the mitral and that fifth clavicular line for the um, for the um, mitral murmurs as well. You'll roll the patient to the left lateral decubitus position if you didn't feel the PMI already. Here you can also go auscultate at the apex of the heart for S3, S4, which we talk about in a little bit what S3 and S4 are. Those are your gallops, right? Your Kentucky and Tennessee, but we'll talk about those in a second. Then you can sit the patient forward, have them exhale, and you can listen with the diaphragm at the left sternal border again and at the apex uh, for aortic regurgitation. Um, when you have them lean forward a little bit, this can accentuate aortic murmurs. So you can have, um, you, you can have them lean forward and, and listen again for aortic issues. When we talk about systolic sounds, so these are sounds that occur during systole. These, so um, during systole is, the systole is the ventricular contraction, remember? So a normal sound during systole is S1. S1 is the closure of the AV valve, so that's, um, you know, those snap shut so that the blood goes out the semilunar valves. Um, you can also sometimes hear a split S1. I've never heard a split S1. But theoretically, if someone, you know, because S1 is the sound of two valves closing at the same exact time, but theoretically the valves might not close at the exact same time, so you could hear... Uh, two separate sounds for that, and that's what a split S1 is. You know, if I had two people try to shut the door, to shut two separate doors at the same exact time, uh, there, there's there's um, room there for some variability. And then, excuse me, extra sounds. Um, other sounds you might hear are clicks. You might hear some murmurs, um, and these are the more common ones, uh, mitral regurge, physiologic murmurs, aortic stenosis, and mitral valve prolapse. Uh, clicks are usually going to be heard mid to late systolic, so not early in systole, but kind of more mid to late. They're usually higher pitched, which means you can hear them with the diaphragm. They um, go away or they're delayed with squatting. Um, they're usually caused by mitral valve prolapse um, and sometimes associated with a mitral valve, uh, mitral regurge murmur the mitral regurgitation murmur, which is usually later in systole. Diastole, or diastolic sounds, are going normally going to be an S2 and a split S2. So same as the S1, um, S2 sound is the closure of two separate valves closing around the same time, hopefully the exact same time. If it's the exact same time, then you won't hear a split S2, but if there's a little bit of delay, then you're, you could hear a split S2. Um, extra sounds, you might hear an opening snap, you might hear S3, S4, S3, S4, your gallops, and we'll talk about those in a bit again, and then some murmurs uh, like mitral stenosis and a aortic regurgitation. It's important to note that a murmur that's in diastole, that occurs in diastole, is always patholog pathologic, so it's always a, a problem. Um, systolic murmurs, the majority of systolic murmurs, especially in younger people, are going to be benign physiologic kind of flow murmurs. Um, so there are some pathologic murmurs in systole, but um, all diastolic murmurs are going to be pathologic. Okay, so the extra heart sounds, these are those S3, S4s. They occur in diastole, so they're both of these are in diastole. S3 is... Um, uh, we call it Kentucky because, and I've underlined the area that's the extra heart sound, so it's Kentucky. Lub dub dub, lub dub dub, lub dub dub, lub dub dub. So the lub is S1, the dub is S2, and the extra dub is the extra heart sound. So lub dub dub, lub dub dub. So it's a early in diastole sound. So S3 is early in diastole. You have S1, S2, and then S3 quickly after the S2. Does that make sense to you guys? Um, whereas S4s are later in diastole. So they actually occur right before S1. Because remember, it's a cycle. It's like a loop. Lub-dub, 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 lub-dub. Lub is S1. Dub is S2. Um, if you have an S3 murmur, it's lub-dub, 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 lub-dub. Whereas an S4 is going to be before the lub. 
So it, we call this a Tennessee, 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 dub, 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 dub. So your, um, your first dub, your first sound is the, is the extra sound, is the S4. So let's try to do this. So lub dub, lub dub, lub dub dub, lub dub dub, lub dub dub. That's a what? S3, right? Because it happened right after the dub. So now we're trying to do the, the S4. Lub dub, dub, lub dub, lub dub, dub lub dub, dub lub dub, dub lub dub, dub dub dub, dub lub dub. So now you can hear that the S4 is right before the lub dub. So in this case, it's a late in diastole murmur. So the S4 is later. Both of them can be pathologic. They can cause, they can be caused by um, fluid overload, CHF, hypertension, volume overload, all those sort of things. Um, aortic stenosis usually causes, aortic stenosis usually causes more of the S4s, but both of them can be caused by hypertension, CHF. Um, S3s can sometimes be heard normally in pregnancy and normally in young, uh, young adults or childhood. So S3s are sometimes more um, physiologic. S4s are generally always um, pathologic. Sometimes you can hear them in an athlete, but uh, otherwise it's going to be from those stiff ventricles. Usually stiff ventricles are from um, hypertension, coronary artery disease, uh, aortic stenosis type of things. Um, both of these are best heard in the apex, uh, the cardiac apex when the patient is in their left lateral decubitus position so that you are um, getting that chest wall closer uh, to the, or sorry, the cardiac um, structures closer to the chest wall so you get a better uh, um, listening, better connection, better, louder sounds. The split S1s and S2s, remember that S1 and S2 are made up of those two separate valves closing. Because of this, if the valves don't close at exactly the same time, it's possible to hear the sound of each of those valves closing separately. So split S1s can be physiologic. Um, both of them can be physiologic. Um, they can also be associated with, um, uh, on the S1, a right bundle branch, right bundle branch block. And the closure of, or I mean a split S2 can be associated with a left bundle branch block. <laughs> uh, but S2s and S1s can be um, physiologic. Um, you don't want to see a, a, a fixed S2 where a fixed X, S2 is where um, you hear the split and when you have the patient take a deep breath and hold it, the split is still there and it sounds exactly the same way. And then if the patient exhales and holds it, the split is still there and, um, and doesn't change at all right? So that's what was called fixed. Usually a split S2 during respiration is a normal finding and happens because of that um, pressure changes, the interthoracic pressure changes during inspiration, which cause the aortic valve to close a little bit before the pulmonic valve. So a split S2 that occurs during inspiration and expiration can be normal, but when you have the patient hold their breath and listen, it should go away. But the fixed S split is abnormal. Um, that's seen in some patients with the ventricular septal defects, um, maybe the left bundle branch block or septal, atrial septal defects. Okay, other heart sounds you could potentially hear a pericardial friction rub. This sounds kind of like a murmur, but there's multiple areas. There's multiple um, components to it. So it's like kind of a scratchy sound that has more than one, usually two, if not three short components to it. It can be all the way throughout systole or diastole, and it's really that inflammation of the pericardial sac that you're hearing um, and not really from valves. So this isn't really valve a valvular sound. You're going to generally hear it along that herbs point, that kind of third, fourth intercostal space on the left sternal border. It's scrapey, scratchy, uh, definitely high pitched, so you'll, you'll be able to hear it with your diaphragm. You can have the patient lean forward. That's going to bring, again, that cardiac um, structures closer to the chest wall and you're going to hear this better. So murmurs. Um, as an RN, it's you, know, you should be able to identify murmurs or, or hear murmurs. Like know that, oh hey, this person has a murmur. But now, as an APRN, you need to say, great, okay, the, there's a murmur. But now you have to be able to assess the timing of it, the location of it, if it's radiating, the intensity, and probably 
you know, moving forward, what type of a murmur it is. So um, the timing of the murmur can help you be identify it as systolic or diastolic. And then you can also talk about if it's early, mid, or late in diastole, early, late, or, or um, early, mid, or late in systole. Uh, so, and then um, other things that are helpful to say is like holosystolic or pansystolic means it's all the way throughout systole. So that's your, you know, when you're hearing a, a, a systolic, a holosystolic murmur, you're hearing lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub stub, lub stub. Lub stub, lub stub, lub stub. That's your holosystolic or pansystolic murmur. So it's all the way through systole. Whereas a mid-systolic might say sound lub dub, lub dub, lub stub, lub stub, lub stub, lub stub, lub stub. So it's not all of systole. It's only part of systole. You'll also want to identify where are you hearing this? Where does the murmur originate? Where do you hear it best? Is it at the base of the heart or is it at the apex of the heart? Um, murmurs at the second inner space, intercostal space on the right systolic border usually indicate aortic valve, right? So left systolic border, sorry, left um, sternal border second intercostal space are usually going to be your pulmonic valves. So remember your ape to man, that way you can kind of identify where I'm hearing a murmur right here, um, loudest right here. So what possible, you know, what are my possibilities? What valves are closing in that area? Um, some murmurs can radiate. Um, some can radiate to the neck. Usually aortic murmurs will, will radiate towards the neck and that's because of the direction that the blood is flowing. Um, some will radiate to the axilla, especially in children. You might hear a murmur radiating to the axilla, um, can, can potentially even to the back with kiddos. So if you hear a murmur in a kid, listen to their axilla, listen to their back. Um, you can grade the murmur based on how intense it is, how loud it is. Grade one out of six, you probably won't hear. It's very faint. It's not heard in all positions, not heard all over the chest. Um, grade two out of six is quiet, but usually you can hear it somewhat immediately. Grade three is moderately loud. So if you're hearing it, it's probably a grade three out of six, maybe a two out of six, but, um, probably a three out of six. Grade four is loud with a thrill. So you can feel a palpable thrill. Grade five out of six is very loud with a thrill heard with the stethoscope partly off the chest. So this is the one that you can hear, um, as you're starting to put the stethoscope on the chest. And then grade six, you can hear the click. You can hear the, um, you can hear the click and the murmur, um, even just sitting next to the person on the couch. You don't even need your stethoscope. And some people who have had aortic stenosis, uh, really severely, you can hear their murmur just, you know, by talking with them or sitting next to them. Um, sometimes people who have had repairs, you can hear sort of the clicking sound. Um, so be familiar and, uh, with those, with that grading systems. You can uh, identify murmurs by pitch, so you can call them high, medium, or low pitched. Uh, you can further categorize them by the quality, if it's a blowing sound, a harsh sound, a rumbling sound, or a musical sound. These get a little bit more descriptive um, and a little bit more, uh, you know, you kind of have to know um, this will come with time, right? And then the shape, the crescendo, the decrescendo, the crescendo, decrescendo, or the plateau murmur. This is, talks about the you know, where's the emphasis? So a murmur that starts loud and then tapers off is going to be a crescendo murmur. Um, and then a decrescendo murmur is going to start soft and, and build. And then the crescendo, decrescendo is going to have that variability. First, the plateau, which is going to be even. So listen to the murmur. Lub dub, lub dub, lub sh dub, lub sh dub, lub sh dub, lub sh dub. So you hear it loudly at first and then it kind of tapers off, but it's kind of holosystolic, right? So you could identify them based on their shape as well. I'm happy if you can identify the location of the murmur, the grading of the murmur. So how are you going to grade it on a six point scale? Um, so location, grading, timing. You know, is it systolic? Is it diastolic? Where are you hearing it? And what is it graded? That's, those are the, um, the best things that, you know, the things that I hope that you can always do. Then the next one of these is probably the quality. You know, is it a harsh murmur? Is it a blowing murmur? Uh, things like that. Okay.
So when you're charting the presence of a murmur, you will chart something like there's a medium pitch grade 2 out of 6 blowing decrescendo diastolic murmur heard best at the fourth left inner space with radiation to the apex. This is a classic aortic regurgitation murmur, which I don't expect you guys to know right away, but there are some that um, you will get to know. Aortic regurgitation, um, aortic stenosis are um, really common, so there's some of those that you definitely should know. So luckily there's a mnemonic for you guys to remember common murmurs. Um, Mr. Pass is the MVP and Miss Ard. So Mr. Pass, the Mr. stands for mitral regurgitation. The P stands for physiologic, the A for aortic stenosis, the S, the last S for systolic, meaning Mr. Pass is the MVP. All of these are systolic murmurs, right? Because this S stands for systolic. And then MVP is mitral valve prolapse. Miss Ard stands for mitral stenosis, AR stands for aortic regurgitation, and D is diastolic. So these are diastolic murmurs. Mitral stenosis and aortic regurgitation are diastolic murmurs. Um, and those are these are really the common murmurs that you're going to hear. There's other act or there's other mnemonics like pass and paid. Pass P A S S stands for pulmonic and aortic stenosis, and those are systolic murmurs. So pulmonic and aortic stenosis um, and uh, are systolic. And then paid P A I D stands for pulmonic and aortic insufficiency, um, and the D of that stands for diastolic. So if you, if you know that pulmonic and aortic insufficiency um, are diastolic, then you know then, you know, um, you can kind of make sense based on which valves are closing. Um, you can kind of make sense as you work, your, work through the cardiac, um, cardiac circulation um, and make, make these murmurs make sense to you based on where you're hearing them and what valves are in that area. Okay, so um, systolic murmurs, uh, they, some, many systolic murmurs, especially in younger healthy people, are functional murmurs. They're just physiologic, normal flow murmurs. They're usually heard all over. There's no radiation. They're soft, usually grade one to three. Um, they're soft to medium pitch. They're usually short, early to mid systolic, and they decrease when someone stands up, when someone sits, or when someone's straining. So you're going to usually hear it just at rest when the patient's lying there, but you might not hear it as soon as they sit up. These are going to be normal murmurs. You don't have to do anything about them. Um, mitral valve prolapse um, is usually heard at the apex. It's a late systolic murmur. It's sometimes associated with a mid-systolic click. Also very common in younger, um, sometimes young females. And it also is, a, um, or it can actually get, get louder, it's accentuated by standing and diminished with squatting. So if you hear a murmur, you can kind of have them stand, have them squat, and see how it changes. Other systolic murmurs like mitral regurge and aortic stenosis, you can see, um, read through these to find the location and, and the characteristics of each murmur. Um, noting kind of the location um, is probably going to be the most helpful for you as well. Diastolic murmurs, there's really, um, you know, the two um, the two main diastolic murmurs are mitral stenosis and aortic regurgitation. Mitral stenosis is usually at the apex, which makes sense because that's where you're hearing the mitral valve, right? And then aortic regurgitation, you hear the aortic valve, um, clo or, yeah, valve closest or loudest in the right sternal border on the second, uh, intercostal space. But this one tends to be kind of, um, um, soft, so you might have the patient lean forward and bring that chest wall closer to the chest. This is a better one to hear when the patient is sitting up, leaning forward. There are some murmurs that you'll want to be aware of in kids. If you remember back to your pediatric assessment in your pediatric nursing days, um, or at least in school, the pat uh, patent ductus arteriosus and ventral septal defect are two of the more common ones. Um, the pa uh, so patent ductus arteriosus is a condition in which the blood vessels, those the ductus arteriosus, doesn't close normally um, soon after birth. So sometimes it's it's often open when the child is um, born, when the infant's born, but then it should close really quick. But if it doesn't close, 
then this can lead to abnormal blood flow between the aorta and pulmonary artery. So you're getting mixture of oxygenate, oxygenated and unoxygenated blood. Um, uh, it tends to be um, this kind of machine gun like murmur. Um, so very intense um, and loud and a lot of times with a thrill. This is one that you can hear up into the neck, into the clavicle, sometimes in the axilla. Uh, ventral septal defect is, um, is also really loud. Pediatric murmurs, these, these um, P PDAs and VSDs are, are really loud. You, you won't usually miss them. The, the problem is that kids' heart rates are so fast that sometimes, you know, their heart is already sounds like a machine gun. Then you add these kind of, you know, these murmurs in there with it. It can be confusing, but you'll learn more about these in your pediatric class as well. Okay, so moving on to the peripheral vascular assessment. So that's the cardiovascular, um, but part of the cardiovascular is looking at the peripheral vascular system as well. So you want to check for you know, swelling and edema and pulsations in the, in the feet and, um, and those things all tie back to um, cardiac structure or cardiac function as well. So when you're feeling the arterial pulses, usually we grade these zero to three. Zero is abnormal, three is abnormal, one and two are somewhere in the middle. Two is what we call brisk and expected. One um, is a little bit less than expected, but you may feel these um, in the distal areas. You can feel pulses, um, and you should feel pulses, the radial pulse, brachial pulse, and femoral pulse. Um, radial, obviously you guys know where that's at, um, probably in the um, that flexor surface of the lateral wrist. The brachial pulse, you can um, feel if you suspect any arterial insufficiency. You'll also be listening to the brachial pulse when you are taking blood pressures. Um, and the femoral pulse down in, you know, near the hips, between the hip and pelvis. Um, you'll want to make sure that you're uh, feeling and, and listening to these. And I think we talked about auscultation a bit, but you can palpate for these areas as well. The um, pulses in the in the feet, so the popliteal pulse um, behind the knees, and then the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibialis are two of the pulses in the feet. The dorsalis pedis is on the dorsum of the foot um, and sometimes is absent congenitally, but you should always be able to feel the, the posterior tibialis. Um, the posterior tibialis is around that medial malleolus, so you find that bone, that medial malleolus, and go right behind that. Uh, you, if there's a problem, if you know, if there's, if these are absent or weak, um, then you need to make sure that you're looking for wounds and ulcers and things like that. Because people who have diabetes, who have peripheral vascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, don't have good circulation, and they need to make sure that you know um, they're they're checking their feet uh, often and um, wearing good shoes. And you know, here in Hawaii, people wear slippers and get these nasty infections and then they're on IV antibiotics for months and months and months. But you can also palpate for the abdominal aortic um, artery. Uh, you can palpate and listen to um, the aortic for brewies. You can um, also um, try to auscultate the renal um, renal artery. You can't really palpate the renal artery because it's too deep, but you can auscultate for the for renal uh, brewies. Uh, renal artery stenosis, which could indicate, you know, the only time I've ever done listen for renal artery stenosis um, is in someone who has hypertension who's young and who, um, you know, blood pressure medication isn't really help, isn't, you know, helping a whole lot, um, then I'll, you know, we'll listen. But this is that hypertensive patient in their 30s or 40s that um, otherwise you wouldn't expect to see. You can also auscultate for the femoral arteries as well, for brewies. If you hear a brewy, then you probably need to get the patient into vascular or cardiovascular for, um, you know, ar arterial insufficiency or um, arterial disease. There are some special tests. The Allen's test you don't really need to do probably in primary care, and since we're training you for primary care, um, but those of you that have worked in the hospital and uh, you, and take uh, ABGs or arterial blood blood samples, uh, you need to test test for the uh, Allen's test first, uh, which just makes sure that there's uh, multiple um, multiple arteries bringing bringing blood oxygenated blood to the hand, uh, because you should have two arteries that bring blood to your hand. Some people can generally have one of them missing, so. It, you want to check this before you go ahead and puncture um, that area because if the vena puncture or if the arterial puncture goes um, south, 
you don't want to compromise um, blood flow to the hand. So um, check in Allen's test, and I think this is on your on your um, YouTube on your skills YouTube. So um, the other one, the ankyobrachial index. This is a screening test uh, for peripheral vascular disease, um, arterial peripheral arterial disease, and it's quick. It's not invasive. You can um, you can assess the arteries in your legs and arms, which become kind of narrow and blocked. Um, and people with peripheral arterial disease obviously are at higher risk of stroke, heart attacks, poor circulation, wounds, gangrene, amputations, etc. Um, so you can actually have your nurses do this. So often in, in my setting, I just have the nurses check ABIs, check ankle brachial index. And I do this sometimes before I put someone on... Um, before I use TED hose, because you don't want to use TED hose in someone who has, um, you know, you want to use TED hose in someone who has vascular venous insufficiency, but not really arterial insufficiency, because you want to keep the, um, you don't want to limit any blood flow from getting down there. So um, you take your blood pressure in an arm and then in the pedal pulse, and then you calculate um, a reading for the right and the left. So you divide your arm pressure by your ankle pressure, and an ABI 0.9 to 1.3 is normal. If it is low, then that's bad. If it's below, you know, 0.9. If it's higher, then whatever. But um, if it's low, 0.41 to 0.9, then that's mild to moderate disease. If the ABI is 0 to 0 0.4, that's severe disease and critical stenosis. Um, these um, can be, again, helpful when you're trying to decide um, about TED hose use and things like that. Um, Holman sign isn't all that clinically useful, but we still teach it and we still do it and we still chart it often. So um, this is a test for suspected DVT, deep vein thrombosis. It's got fairly low diagnostic value um, with a sensitivity in you know 10 to 50 percent and then the specificity of 39 to 89 percent. Um, and it's really more only helpful in someone who has unilateral leg swelling probably also immobility or other risk factors like recent surgery, orthopedic surgery, tr recent travel, um, immobility, bed bound, uh, things like that. Um, you forcefully dorsiflex the foot and um, feel for calf, calf discomfort. Uh, so this is also talked about in your guys' skills lab. But I think I, I read somewhere that Dr. Holman, who um, who had a whole lot of medical advances, was somewhat mortified after the fact that this is the one thing that he's remembered by. So that, that's pretty funny. But anyway, okay, this is it for the um, cardiovascular and peripheral vascular exam. Make sure you watch your skills videos, and I will see you in class. Bye.